at Christmas time, I like to show letters that kids write to God. Here's one. Dear God, why is Sunday school on Sunday? I thought it was supposed to be a day of rest. <laughs> Dear God, I bet it is very hard for you to love all of everybody in the whole world. There are only four people in our family, and I can never do it. <laughs> Leave it to kids. I'd like to speak about waiting for Christmas. Uh, it's the fifth today, and we have 20 days uh, to wait. Some parents allow their children to open up one gift uh, Christmas Eve, so it's 19 days. Um, I, I, one time Joey asked me, and he would ask several times things like, when is it coming? When is Christmas coming? So one, day, one, day, one year I said, Joey, you missed it. It was, it was yesterday. Where were you? <laughs> the first Christmas took place a year and a half before Jesus was born. And Luke describes it this way. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zechariah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. He goes on to say they were both righteous before God and blameless. What's interesting is that Luke, in one sentence, puts a wicked king, Herod, next to a righteous man, Zechariah. When I think of that, I think of somebody putting Hitler next to Mother Teresa in the same sentence. It doesn't seem to fit. Or Al Capone and Billy Graham in the same sentence. It doesn't fit. But, but Herod was a very wicked man and well-known. Zechariah was unknown and a very righteous man. But they had a problem. As righteous as they were and as blameless as they were. They had no child. Because Elizabeth was barren and they were both well advanced in years. No child in that day meant that they were out of God's favor. That's the way people saw it. They believed that if you had children, it was a blessing of the Lord. If you didn't have children, it was a sign that God was disappointed in you. And so there were whispering campaigns going on all their lives, I wonder what she did not to be blessed. I wonder what he did not to be blessed with a child. And, and if there were any faith teachers around, which there usually are, there were certainly in the time of Job, the faith teachers always have an answer for everything that might go wrong. And they would have said, well, it's because she lacks faith or has a secret sin. Seems like that's the answer that they have for any kind of a problem that comes along. But that wasn't true because God said they were righteous and they were blameless. I think the question is, can you really live with fault finders, people who find fault? Because there are always going to be people who believe they have the gift of criticism and they're going to use it occasionally on you. And you have to learn how to duck and weave and roll with the punch. People have opinions, and they'd be sharing their opinions. Can we live with them? Can we live with stuff like that? Because we have to learn to. They were advanced in years, which means it means that when it was their birthday, they spent more money on the candles than they did on the cake. They were advanced in years. A couple of years ago, I had a girl come to me and meet me at the door on the way out, and she said, Pastor Joe, have you shrunk? I said, I don't think so. And then I realized I knew her when she was a little girl. And she was getting taller, and I was getting older. That's the only difference. Waiting for Christmas. We wait. Nancy Ann does shopping in July, and she waits. The kids wait. The tree's already up, but we're waiting for Christmas. Now, Zechariah was chosen. The scripture says this, his lot, which means that so many priests in that day, tens of thousands of priests, that they couldn't all serve in the temple, so they cast lots. They threw the dice. His lot fell to burn incense in the holy place, 
when he went into the temple of the Lord. I want you to notice something about this. His lot fell, and so you think of dice, you think of chance, you think of an accident, but nothing happens by accident, nothing. God's hand is in everything, including the roll of the dice. And it doesn't matter whether the circumstances are good or bad. God's involved. When Joseph was thrown in prison and for two years he was waiting around, God was busy, in control. Zechariah just didn't happen by accident to be picked. He was picked on purpose. God had a purpose in mind when he was given the job of putting incense on the hot coals in the holy place. The whole multitude would be waiting outside praying as Zechariah went into the temple and he put the hot coals, they put the incense on the hot coals and there was smoke. And out of that smoke, an angel appeared, the angel Gabriel. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. How many times have you read in the Bible that the angel of the Lord or God said, do not be afraid? There is one thing that we have a common denominator. We are vulnerable. And it doesn't matter who you are, you can become afraid. Something can happen that will cause you to be afraid. Zachariah certainly was not expecting anybody to meet him in the holy place. And the angel came, and he was afraid. And the angel said, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer is heard. This is an amazing thing. Your prayer is, they're old. You mean they're still praying for a baby? Your prayer is heard. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you shall call his name John. God heard their prayer. There's some people, they give up praying because after all they feel the time has gone by and there's no chance that there could be any answer. If, you're wait, if you are waiting, if whoever you are, if you are waiting for God, you're in good company. Abraham waited for God, for the promised son. Moses waited for God in a wilderness. David waited for God in a cave. Joseph waited for God to bring about the promise that he had waited. Wait, it seems like waiting is something we all learn. We wait to grow up. We wait to graduate. We wait to get married. We wait to have children. We wait to get a job. I remember somebody was waiting on a DMV line. Have you ever waited on a DMV line? This is what, this is what he says. He, he says he was waiting on a DMV line. He had just bought a brand new car and he got to the window. He finally got to the window. He wanted to register his car as an antique. He said, when I got on the line, it was a brand new car. <laughs> waiting. How long have we been waiting for this pandemic to go away? And just when you think it's safe to walk out without a mask, Another virus comes along to surprise us. Waiting. Let me give you something that you could think about. The sequoia tree, the huge sequoia tree, weight 175 to 200 years for the first flower to bloom to produce seeds. 175, and it takes 3,000 of their little seeds to weigh one ounce. So if you're getting tired of waiting, I think one of the things that God teaches us is, is there's something about wait, waiting, wait. God wants to, us to learn how they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Some people wait on the Lord and they lose their strength. God wants us to gain strength when we're waiting. 
So Zechariah and Elizabeth waited, but they didn't quit praying. They kept on praying. And the angel said to Zechariah, he, your son, John, will be great. In fact, the angel knew Zechariah's name, knew Elizabeth's name, knew the name of the boy, and knew the purpose of that child. He will be great. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. He will turn many to the Lord. He will go in the spirit and the power of Elijah. He's going to fulfill prophecy. He will make ready the people, prepare for the Lord. And after 400 years of silence, God did not speak from Malachi to the book of Matthew. 400 years of silence, there will be a revival in the land 400 years later. So there was something special about John. And the angel is sharing that with Zechariah, and he says, how can I know this? I'm an old man. My wife is well advanced in years. It was his way of saying, how am I going to I won't even live long enough to see all the things you just told me about this son. I would like a sign. <laughs> yeah, the angel said, I am Gabriel. I stand before the presence of God and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings and you're asking for a sign. <laughs> Behold, you will be mute and not be able to speak until the day these things take place because you did not believe my words which will be fulfilled in their own time. You know what's interesting about this is that our unbelief does not stop the plan of God. If God waited around for our belief, Jesus would have never been resurrected on Easter Sunday morning. God's got a plan. His plan's going to work, whether we believe or not. Zechariah had a problem believing, but the angel said, you're going to, I'm going to give you a sign. You're going to be silent. God was silent for 400 years. Now you're going to be silent for nine months. And the people waited. The reason why they were waiting is because they're waiting for the priest to come out and close in prayer. But he's been silenced. Could you imagine if I got up here to preach and I couldn't talk? How long would the service be? He would become known as the silent priest. When he came out, he could not speak. And then it says this. They realized he had seen a vision, for he kept making signs to them. Now, I don't know what the signs were, but I think it was something like this. He goes like this. Three words. I. And he took a saw. Saw. <laughs> An angel in there. But the day came when the disgrace that she and he had lived under for years turned into grace. Because it was considered disgraceful not to have a child. And I'm looking at that and I think, you know what? This is our history. This is our testimony. Our disgrace became grace when Jesus came. In fact, Elizabeth said this, and I quote, God took away my reproach among men because she lived with the criticism. And when the baby was born, God took away the reproach and I was wondering if, if Elizabeth was here today, if Elizabeth could speak, she doesn't speak here, but if she were here, you know what she would say to you who are waiting? Hold on. God's got a plan. He will see you through what you're going through. 
Hold on. God's got a plan. He will see you through what you're going through. I know you're holding on. I know that you're waiting. I know that you're long stuff. Hold on. God's got a plan. He will see you through what you're going through. That's what you say. Paul says something in Philippians. He, he says, I have learned that whatever state I am, there with to be content. I thought that's an interesting phrase, and, and I've used it many times in my preaching. I have learned in whatever state I am in, there with to be content. And he goes on to say, I know how to abound. And when I read that, I say, I can be content when I'm abounding. And he says, I know how to be a base. And I say to myself, I don't know how to do that. And then I, the more I'm thinking about it, the more I realize that when, when Paul said, I have learned in whatever state that I am in therewith to be content, it's because his contentment was not connected to the circumstances that he was in. Whether he was high or low, whether he had plenty or nothing, his contentment did not come from his circumstances. It came from his relationship with God. And God never changes. With him there is no variableness. There is no shadow of turning. So our content can come from the fact we know who he is and he is with us and that's where contentment comes from. And that's what Elizabeth would be telling us. And, and Luke tells us something about John I think is really interesting. The third chapter says, and it is written in the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. John the Baptist is just a voice. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight his path. The angel said he's going to be great. He's going to be filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. He's going to turn his world upside down. It's going to be a great revival. And all he was was a voice. Because God uses a voice. We have a voice. God uses voices. He took Jonah, who was an angry prophet, and gave him eight words. Sent him to Nineveh. In 40 days, this city will be destroyed. God took those eight words, turned the city upside down. It was a city-wide revival. It never happened before. It never happened since. Eight words. God took Moses, gave him four words, let my people go. And two and a half million Jews were freed from bondage because God uses words, voices, your voice. You know, sometimes you think, you know, Lord, if I had a million dollars, I would give. <laughs> and God would say, God, a voice, give it. Give what you got. And when John saw Jesus, he said, behold, he used his voice, behold, the Lamb of God slain from the foundations of the world. He used his voice. He used his voice to present Jesus. That's what we need. To, we need to use our voice to be his voice. He has no voice but our voice. Has no hands but our hands. Has no feet but our feet. God uses his voice. You know, and I was thinking about that. And I realized that the whole Bible is, is, is about a voice. In the beginning, God said, let there be light. And we know from reading the Bible that Jesus is the light of the world. So right from the beginning, Jesus is introduced. In the end, the last book in the Bible, in the last sentence of the book, it says, even so come Lord Jesus. So from cover to cover, Jesus is the beginning and the end. He's the Alpha, the Omega, the first and the last. It's all about Jesus. And so we use our voice in order to project Jesus in some way. You can project Jesus by praising him, by worshiping him, by, how about, by being kind and being caring.
The psalmist tells us, I will say. Sometimes we read the Bible, we read through real quickly, and we don't stop to think about what it is we're reading. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge. When did he say that? When he was in a cave. When he was afraid. When he was running for his life. When it seemed like the promises of God were so far from ever being refilled, I will say. Can you imagine that? What a message right there. Just, I, will, I don't care what the circumstance, I will say. I don't care how I feel, I will say. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge. I cried unto the Lord and he heard my voice. I will cry. Call upon me in a day of trouble, I will deliver you. I, will, I, said, I cried unto the Lord. I used my voice. I cried unto the Lord and he heard me. Because God hears our voice. He certainly hears us when we cry. He hears us when we call him. John used his voice. That's all he had. He had a voice in God. He must have had a powerful voice because he cried in the wilderness. If I cried in the wilderness, <laughs> nobody would hear me. <laughs> John had a powerful voice. And you know what it says about John? It's interesting. Luke says, John did no miracle, but everything he said about Jesus was true. He was a voice. Don't need a miracle. You need a voice. Let God take care of the miracles. God has given us a voice, so we use our voice. And, and, and uh, on the day of Pentecost, and we know the story about Pentecost, on the day of Pentecost, 120 were in the upper room, and there was a mighty shaking wind blowing, rushing, mighty wind. And, and, and then Peter had explained what was going on. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. So he said, so he, 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 he quotes Joel. He said, it came to pass in the, in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Because when my spirit comes on them, they'll be able to say. And in the upper room, the Spirit gave them utterance because we need God's Spirit to use our voice. Our voice needs to project Jesus. And what were they saying in the upper room? They just read Acts, the second chapter, and they were praising God. They were extolling the works of God. It took a miracle to hang the earth in space. That's a miracle. It took a miracle to put the stars in place. That's a miracle. But the real miracle. But when he saved my soul, cleansed and made me whole and you, it took a miracle of love and grace. That's what they were talking about. 120 in the upper room. In the tongues of people that understood what they were saying. Because God wants to use your voice. And he wants to use my voice. To glorify his name. Maybe that's the reason why David said, oh Come on and magnify the Lord with me. You, you look at the word magnify, magnify. Magnify means make bigger, but you can't make God bigger. How can you make God bigger than he already is? He's already big. The only way we can magnify the Lord is make him bigger inside of us. Bigger in our mind, bigger in our spirit, bigger in our heart, bigger in our outlook, bigger with our expectation, bigger, bigger, bigger. Oh, mag oh, magnify the Lord with me, blessed Lamb of Calvary. Use our voice to praise him, to magnify him, to worship him. 
I want to open up the altar this morning as a song that is, keeps coming on in my head throughout the week. Let the cry of my heart be to worship you. Let my voice worship. To see your splendor, to behold your magnitude, to behold how big you are, big enough to rule the entire universe, small enough to get inside of my heart and rule me, to ascribe to your name the glory that is due. Let the cry of my heart be to worship you. Lord, I want my voice to lift up your name. I want my voice to magnify you. I want my voice to speak to my own heart, to speak to my own mind, to speak to my depression, to speak to my discouragement, to, to speak to my disappointment. Let, let your voice be in me and speak to the things that hold me down and remind me that I still have a God who, even though I've waited a long time, he will come through. That's the message of Chris, Christmas. In the fullness of time, Jesus came. And he will come for you. This altar is open as we sing. I'll be glad to pray with you. To worship you. Let the cry of my heart be to worship you. Your splendor, to behold your magnitude, to ascribe to your name the glory that is due. Let the cry of my heart be to worship.